Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Barbara Gross, Dean of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, and I'm delighted to welcome you to Driving Change, Shaping Lives, Gender in the Developing World. It's wonderful so many have joined us for what I expect will be an engrossing exploration. In addition to the audience here in the gym, we have participants viewing the conference remotely in Agassiz Theater, and I'd like to extend a special welcome to those who are joining us via the internet. I'm delighted we were able to take advantage of technology to bring a conference with an international scope to a global audience. Each year, the Radcliffe Institute honors its predecessor, Radcliffe College, by holding a conference on a topic related to gender that may be approached from many perspectives and from a broad range of disciplines. As we began reaching out to faculty across the university for ideas about a conference that would focus on gender and the developing world, we heard responses unanimous on two points. This is a very, very important topic, and it's broad. We have chosen to focus on five key areas of life, health, education, migration, politics, technology, and media. Each panel was devised to reflect the natural overlap among subject areas, highlighting not only the interactions among the problems each panel will confront, but also the potential for synergies in designing solutions. The panels are geographically diverse and cross-disciplinary. They interleave scholarship and practical experience. The scholars, scientists, physicians, politicians, activists, journalists, and government officials who are speaking bring varied perspectives to bear on issues affecting the lives of women and men in the developing world. While you're here, I hope you will also visit the Schlesinger Library's exhibit, Our Bodies, Ourselves, The Collective Goes Global, and the technology exhibit, New Ideas, Old Challenges, Innovation in the Developing World, which is in the Byerly Hall gallery space. You'll be amazed at how many great things come in small packages. Also, for those who are already in the gym, you might turn around and look at the small tent up on the um, uh, track. Uh, this was a product of students this past January. It's meant to be a disaster rescue tent that pops up quickly with helium balloons. Just a sample of what uh, technology has been produced. Please take a moment, too, to view the display of photographs around the gym, all of which were taken by Harvard freshmen. This artwork and the exciting artistic performances throughout the conference let the arts speak in their own voices about gender in the developing world. It's usually difficult to measure the impact of creative cross-disciplinary encounters fostered by conferences like this one. So I want to share a gratifying outcome from an earlier conference, which I learned about just recently. In the spring of 2009, the Institute held the conference, Gender in the Law, Unintended Consequences, Unsettled Questions. A few weeks ago, Jacqueline Baba, who served as the moderator of the panel on gendered states of citizenship, let me know that Lord Justice Brenda Marjorie Hale, who spoke on that panel, cited Jackie's work in a recent United Kingdom Supreme Court case. This case decided against the deportation of asylum seekers with children born in the UK because such action violates the best interest of their citizen children. Jackie said, and I quote, the Radcliffe Conference was critical to this cross-fertilization and indirectly to a big victory for immigrant families and their citizen children. I am so grateful to you for that. We too are grateful and we look forward to hearing back from you in the future about connections made at this conference. Before we begin, I would like to thank a number of people 
without whom this conference would not have been possible. Bridget Madrian, Senior Advisor to the Social Sciences Program at the Radcliffe Institute, an economist and Aetna Professor of Public Policy and Corporate Management at the Harvard Kennedy School, had the insight for this conference. She, it's really her brainchild. She has brought to the intellectual side of the planning keen insights and a daunting breadth of knowledge of the issues. Thank you, Bridget. Many thanks, too, to the faculty from all over the university who joined in brainstorming meetings to generate potential topics and speakers. I'm especially grateful to the core committee of faculty planners who helped winnow these ideas. Eris Bonet from the Harvard Kennedy School, Caroline Elkins from the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, Paula Johnson from Harvard Medical School, and for Fernando Reimers from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. You can see the reach was broad. These faculty provided valuable insights and facilitated connections with leading speakers in each topic area. My sincere thanks to the many staff throughout Radcliffe Institute who helped mount this conference and the surrounding events this week. I'm deeply grateful to Rebecca Wasserman, Director of Academic Ventures at the Institute, who oversaw all aspects of the planning of the conference and this week, including student participation and the exhibits. Thanks to Maura Mauden in Ventures and Jess Brilly in Communications for mounting such an elegant techn technical exhibit, and to the Schlesinger Library staff for the wonderful exhibit on our bodies, ourselves. More special thanks to the staff and academic events management and the advancement team, who together expertly coordinated all the logistics of this conference and a week full of activities. Finally, thanks to Danielle Cotter for great writing. To our speakers, who have traveled from all over the world, from five continents, to be here today, a very warm welcome and our deep gratitude for bringing your expertise to enlighten us. Thank you as well to the moderators, many of whom participated in planning the conference. Would you please join me in thanking all these people? And now it's my great pleasure to turn the podium over to Bridget Madrian. I don't know what else I can add after uh, uh, Barbara's expansive introduction to the conference. We are truly delighted that you are all here uh, and able to join us. We are truly grateful for all of the help that we've had from so many people across campus in planning this event. And one of the things we really wanted to do in putting the conference together was to make this an event that brought uh, all of the all of the Harvard community together in different ways. So we've had faculty from throughout the university involved in uh, planning uh, and helping to moderate the panels and helping to host our guests while they've been here on campus. We've also tried very hard to try and uh, get student involve involvement, as Barbara noted. Uh, and you can see some of that uh, during the course of the conference. And also to get the arts community at Harvard involved in a conference that, on the face of things, might actually not look like it has a whole awful lot to do, uh, to do with the arts. We encourage you to take advantage of some of these uh, ancillary activities. I am really looking forward to going over and seeing some of the uh, exhibits, uh, um, uh, some of the exciting things that uh, other people are contributing to the conference and encourage you to do so as well. So with that, I think we should get on with the, the business of the conference and uh, sit back and uh, uh, open your minds to the great thoughts and ideas that I'm sure we're going to hear for the rest of the afternoon. Ziwagowe 
too. And to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you today to the Radcliffe Institute. Ikawe la makawe. Ikoha la makoha. Umavula kuvaliwe. Di teta ngobanina ziwa kowe tu. Di teta ngoma dibogde. Uyem yem ungolom sila. Itole lom kuba. Lonko mozaba tembu. Wafunga kumanzi omlangu ichume. Wafute wate 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 ingo do zama kote kikili. Getesha ikat alikika tika liteli kaulu kototo. Mamela ni kenditi ndizo ni kake zanga ma kake za wenga ele. Tulula ke si pula pule. Zenizi bazi nchepe kema kwetini. Ndekham. Ningu lili. You have just witnessed a performance of an original work of Osa Poetry Praise by Sia Uza. Sia hails from South Africa and is currently a junior at Harvard concentrating in engineering sciences. You might not guess that from his dramatic activities. Um, he developed an interest in aeronautics at a very young age when he saw election pamphlets drop from an airplane back in 1994. This interest matured into a study of rockets, which led him to develop a new type of rocket fuel that is cheaper, safer, and more efficient than the fuels used today. For this work, which was done while he was still in high school, he won two top honors at the 58th Intel International Science and Engineering Fair, the world's largest student science event. Lincoln Laboratories even named a minor planet in the main asteroid belt near Jupiter after him because they were so impressed by his achievements. I think I'm going to add that to my bucket list, get an asteroid <laughs> named after me. Osa Prey's poetry is historically an oral genre. It is primarily an oral art that remains inextricably tied to performance an art that is actualized in performance creation through gestures, the intricate interplay between performers and audience, and the general spirit of the occasion. And I think he set quite a spirit here uh, today. The traditions of oral poetry are long established among the Osa-speaking peoples, and the custom of praise poetry remains an important part of contemporary culture in South Africa today. Sia will now kindly provide us an English translation of the poem he has just performed. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to join you today for this important conference. My name is Siabule Lakuza, and I'm a proud member of the Kosa clan. Um, Kosa praise singing is not only used to ignite the atmosphere at important events such as today, it's also used as an important means of expressing my culture. It's, it's an important means of addressing certain issues through culture, such as gender issues, cultural issues through this artistic means. So I try to use art as a means of conveying important messages. And without giving you a long translation, the poem that I composed particularly for today, was targeted at you, the audience. I was welcoming you today to this institute, and I tried to intertwine certain issues regarding gender and some, of the and some of the issues that you'll be discussing today into one artistic package, which I hope you all enjoyed. And with that welcome, I am now going to turn the time over to our first group of panelists and the moderator for this first panel, uh, which is on shifting populations, is Ambassador Swanee Hunt, who is the Eleanor Roosevelt Lecturer in Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. And I will uh, allow her to introduce the uh, remaining panelists and turn the time over to her. Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. Wow, I love the energy. Isn't it great? Uh, I, you know, I'm not going to spend time introducing myself. I, you mentioned my connection to the Kennedy School, and I think there, there are very adequate bios in the back. So uh, let me just tell you that I have been around. I've been working on 
um, what shall I say, the how to achieve parity of women in decision making, both in the political uh, sense. Uh, I've been working in about 60 countries, and uh, as well as focusing particularly on war zones in about 40 war zones, and uh, now focusing quite a bit on what we call sex trafficking, which as you know, the FBI is now defining in the US as simply force, fraud, or coercion, or uh, anyone who's under the age of consent. So that represents almost all prostituted sex, not all of it, but most of it. And so I'm doing that both through the school, but also individually through a number of other projects. And so it is a great pleasure for me to introduce to you three experts in this field, not of sex trafficking, but of shifting migrations and, and what's happening as we look, broadly speaking, to women in the world. And again, I am not going to go through the bios that are in the back of your program. I assume that those bios are one of, are one of the reasons that you came today. And so feel free to be reading in the back. As I say, my friend Valerie Hudson, is right here. She's a professor of political science at Brigham Young University and has done some, some really um, groundbreaking work, this isn't in the bio in the same way, uh, collecting statistics on what's happening with women all over the world. She is a global thinker and a trailblazer. She is the professor of political science at the university and um, her foci include foreign policy analysis, gender and international relations, methodology, and security studies. And then next to her is Rosel Salazar Pereñas. We're glad you're here. Thank you. She's the professor, a professor of sociology at the University of Southern California and has published widely on the topic of feminization of women's labor and migration. Again, look in the back of your program for much, much more. Um, Amy, it's so good to see you again. Uh, Amy and I have been uh, crossing paths for many a year, and she is the senior advisor to the director at the Department of State's office to monitor and combat trafficking in persons. Many of you are familiar with the TIP report that comes out of the State Department every year, and finally this year includes the United States of America, which before we didn't realize should be included when we talked about international, right? Get it? Like, okay. Uh, anyway, it wasn't Amy's fault. Uh, Amy's on the side of the angels here, and she was one of the people who designed that report and figured out how it would be disseminated. So she's one of my heroes, actually, in this world. Uh, the, here's how we generally are going to operate even though there may be some flexibility here as, as we need to. And that is that we're thinking that um, each one of our panelists is going to do some speaking. And after that, the other panelists will be able to ask some questions to clarify or to maybe raise a point. We will not take very long in that part after. Um, and then when we're finished with all three, of you with that process. Then we're going to open it up for some more conversation among the three of you and then among the audience in general. And we will end one minute before we're supposed to end. How's that, Barbara? Can you tell I've been in your position? Yeah, right. I know how to make friends. All right. OK, so Valerie, with that, Mm -hmm. general idea of how we'll operate. Is, may I turn it over to you to you certainly may. I, address this subject any way you want to go at it? Great. I have a PowerPoint, so I'm assuming that we'll be able to... Okay, super. And if you want to just give me a high sign about a minute before you want me to... Sure. Thanks. All right, um, today I'm going to address uh, the topic of the relationship between sex, demographics, and peace through the use of a case study um, that is, I think, a, 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 a particular instance of a broader relationship that I think that researchers are beginning to tease out between the security of women and the security of states. So I'm going to address that broader issue first for a moment, and then we'll get into the case study, and I will go as fast as I can. <laughs> um, 
Uh, as a member of the security studies field, uh, often when we speak about conflict in the world, uh, we, we tend toward mainstream um, ex explanations for that conflict, and those would include ethno-nationalism, deficit of democracy, poverty and resource scarcity, ideological conflict, imbalances uh, in power or power vacuums in the international system. But what about the situation and security of women within those nation states? Um, this is something that's been largely overlooked in security studies, which as some critics have suggested is kind of a womanless uh, world. Um, so at first blush, as a security studies person, you think, well, women, security, you know, national security, probably not in the same conceptual space. And yet we see immense movement, I would argue, in the policymaking community that does see the linkage between the security of women and the security of states. For example, one of my favorite quotes is by Kofi Annan, former Secretary General of the UN, who in 2006 said, the world is starting to grasp that there is no policy more effective in promoting development, health, and education than the empowerment of women and girls. And I would venture that no policy is more important in preventing conflict or in achieving reconciliation after a conflict has ended. Right? So we've seen UN Security Council Resolution 1325, 1880, 1888, and so forth, the establishment of the U new UN Women's Organization this past July. I think all of this tells us that uh, scholarship has been lagging behind what people in the policy world have come to accept. Uh, one example of this, and I don't pretend that you can see any of the little uh, writing, so don't even try. Um, when colleagues in my department challenged me and said that uh, if you wanted to look at conflict, you, you needed to look you know, at uh, the major causes of blood spilt in the world, uh, democratization and ideology. So I, I did just a little thought experiment, and uh, in the left-hand column, the blue column, uh, you see the death tolls from uh, some of the major conflicts, World War I, World War II, Stalin, Mao, et cetera. And then as you go up and you get these little thinner slices, those are all the conflicts that are listed to the, to the right. In other words, I tried to put in every last interstate conflict, civil conflict, genocide, you name it, all right? And uh, your death toll ends up slightly more than 150 million. And then the right-hand column, I put um, various estimates of how many women are missing from the world population in just one year, all right, in one snapshot of the generations in 2005, and that is 163 million. So if we want to look at blood spilt and lives lost in humanity as a security issue, we would be remiss if we did not see that a, that a large number, in fact, perhaps disproportionately large number, are in fact women. So surely we understand that the security of the state impacts the security of women. But might the security of women impact the security of state? Uh, we developed a theoretical framework, which I will not go into, but in our first um, major empirical finding, we discovered that a better predictor of state peacefulness and uh, state stability was not level of democracy or level of wealth or even civilization, you know, which civilization one's, one belongs to in the Huntington sense. But in fact, the best predictor was the physical security of women within a population. And, uh, and so this encouraged us um, to combine our findings with research findings from other scholars who found that the level of violence against women uh, is related to non-compliance by the state with international norms, worse relations with neighboring states, uh, more likely to be involved in conflict, but also to use violence first in a conflict, uh, and so forth. So something is going on. And I think that Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton um, kind of said it very baldly last year on the occasion of International Women's Day when she said, the subjugation of women is a direct threat to the security of the United States. Now that might sound a little bit of an amb ambitious, perhaps uh, overgeneralization, but I would like to suggest to you that as we look at particular case studies, uh, that um, uh, Secretary of State Clinton's 
pronouncement may not be off base. So what I'd like to do now is to turn to the case study of the abnormal sex ratios of China and India. Now, I'm sure that some of you are aware, maybe you're not, I certainly was not when I began our, my research 15 years ago, um, that sun preference has been, in social science jargon, enacted, that is, uh, dispensing of female uh, infants and children and preferring males. Um, you can find that in virtually every civilization, whether we're talking about ancient Greece, ancient Rome, European, you know, you can find it in nearly every civilization. But only in Asia do we see that legacy still in force today. Uh, in order to understand the, the gap that we're seeing, the degree of abnormality that we're seeing, you have to keep a number of ratios in mind. The normal birth sex ratio is between 105 and 107 boy babies being born for every 100 girl babies on the planet. However, since uh, um, very small boys uh, are um, more likely to die of diarrheal and respiratory diseases, as well as fall prey to congenital sex-linked illnesses, by the time you get um, uh, to about five, you've got about 100 boys per 100 girls for children over five. And then the normal overall sex ratio for all ages is about 98 to 99 men per 100 women because of women's longer lifespan. All right, so if you have those ratios in mind, let's take a look at what we've got. Now, I've got to tell you that I almost wish that I had been invited to this conference a year from now or a conference like it because some of you may know that uh, China's decennial census results will be announced sometime in the next four months. Uh, and likewise, India is about a six months after that. So I, I feel a little bit hobbled in having to give you data, uh, official data, that is almost a decade old in some cases. But let's go for it. Okay. So if we look at overall sex ratio by continent, and remember overall sex ratio should be about 98, 99, we can see some anomalies here. One of the biggest anomalies, of course, is in Asia, where we see an overall sex ratio of 104.4. And we're going to talk about the scale, the number of lives that that um, uh, uh, refers to. In Europe, you see an abnormally low sex ratio, where there are actually more women than men in Europe than should be. What I'd like you to also notice is the world sex ratio. We commonly talk of women as being half of humanity. But because of what is happening in Asia, and because over 40% of world population is in Asia, women are no longer half of humanity, okay? which is kind of a stunning insight when you think about it. If we look at zero to four sex ratios, again, we would like to see 104, 105. Um, we see in Africa, due to the disease burden, that that's actually lower than normal. Um, fewer boys survive early childhood than should. Uh, but notice in Asia again, almost 107, okay, um, which is significantly abnormal. If you turn to birth sex ratios, those are sometimes hard to come by, but I do have some figures for you. Uh, most recent figures that I could find were China Daily Figures, which is an official publication, an official organ of the Chinese Communist Party. And in 2007, their figures were that for overall of China, the figure was now about 120. So instead of 105 to 107 boy babies being born per 100 girls, it is 120. And in some cases, it was much, much higher. So for example, in Hainan, the, rate, the birth sex ratio was 136 boy babies being born for every 100 girl babies. In India, um, the 2001 census um, says that the, the birth sex ratio is about 110, 111. However, um, spot censuses, sample censuses, for example, in the Delhi area, show a birth sex ratio of 121. We see in South Korea normalization of birth sex ratios over time, which is a you know, stunning success story. But in Taiwan, it remains stubbornly at between 108 and 110. In fact, the very latest figures show a slight worsening back to 109. Um, if we took just seven countries in Asia uh, and we looked at the number of missing women and we took the most conservative estimate that we could get, we would be looking at at least 90 million women missing from the population who should arguably be there. The UNFPA uh, made their own estimate in 2005, and their assertion 
is that we are missing 163 million women who should arguably be in the population. Now, we can see this graphically, okay? Um, uh, the, the, the great rise in these birth sex ratios is due primarily to new technology that has made it possible to identify sex in utero uh, without in invasive amniocentesis and so forth. So primarily ultrasound, allowing you to detect at about 14 to 16 weeks gestation the sex of the fetus. So you can see over time there, this, this uh, technology was introduced into Asia in uh, around uh, 1985. So you can see from 1981, before ultrasound technology was prevalent, and then 1991, and then 2001, the spread of abnormal sex ratios. Okay, great. Judith Bannister has shown the same thing in China. This is 82, before we get uh, uh, ultrasound technology. Everything that is not yellow is abnormal. Let me just quickly scroll through these. All right, so here is um, 1990, 1995, 2000, okay, that it has spread like a cancer on that land. There are various aggravating factors, certainly the one-child policy, traditions of dowry, patrilocality, social security norms where sons are responsible for their parents in old age, et cetera, et cetera. I won't go into it. It's important to note that female infanticide and sex-selective abortion, even telling a pregnant woman the sex of her fetus, are all strictly illegal in these countries. Uh, but that has not changed the picture on the ground. The other side of the, of the issue is the number of, in a sense, surplus males. Uh, there's males surplus to the number of females within their country's population. So by the year 2020, you're looking at about 30 million young adult Indian males who will be surplus to the number of females in the society. China, our conservative figures said maybe as high as 33 million. The Chinese government is now saying 40 million, 40 million bare branches, which is what the Chinese call young men surplus because of female infanticide in their society. 12 to 15 percent of the young adult male cohort will not be able to form households. So the question is, well, what happens when that's the case? And what we would like to suggest, and um, I'm just going to have to give you a very short version, is that um, those who are not going to marry are already young men who are at risk for sociopathic behavior. Uh, those who will not marry will be those who are uneducated, who have no skills, no wealth, and so forth. Um, and so this class of men is already at risk for lawbreaking. We find no male social transition for this 12 to 15 percent, making them at higher risk for coalitional violence. And what we will see is rising violence and crime and possibly localized rebellion. Second level of analysis is the governmental level. Do states become aware of that, that abnormal sex ratios are playing into this instability in their society? And the answer is yes. And if you look at the repertoire of responses that have been historically used by governments facing uh, an abnormal sex ratio situation, uh, we have government crackdowns leading to greater authoritarianism, large-scale public works projects, encouraging immigration, recruiting them into the military, uh, maintaining kind of a, kind of a very uh, sort of aggressive or masculine type of foreign policy, conflictual in tone and very sensitive to insults. And in ethnically diverse societies, you may even see the government attempt to pit ethnic groups uh, against each other to focus their attention away from the government. So what our research uh, kind of demonstrates is that the calculus of deterrence may be different for a high sex ratio state than a normal sex ratio state. We should not assume that what would deter the latter would deter the former. Barbara D. Miller at George Washington University, the famous anthropologist, has said a normal sex ratio is a public good which should be protected by the state. And what we see is that the states, both in China and India, have taken some steps to address this. In China, there are small old age pensions now for families that have only daughters. However, when I was in Beijing last year, uh, my uh, interviewees would laugh when I mentioned this. They said, one of them said, oh, that, that would buy me maybe four boxes of matches, 
Okay, so the, the incentive structure is not changed as a result of these pensions. However, school fees for girls are paid in daughter-only families. Um, in some regions of China, there has been a prohibition of ultrasound after 14 weeks of gestation. And virtually all my interviewees felt that China would go to a de facto two-child policy, uh, possibly in 2015. De facto meaning that while it would still be against regulations to have a second child, that the state authorities would not implement any fines or punishments if you did have a second child. In India, in addition to cradle baby arrangements, we have, ta-da, in 2006, the first doctor ever arrested Okay, for uh, sex-selective abortion. Uh, if any of you know the Indian judicial system, my understanding is um, that trial has still not gone forward, so we'll see what happens. But there was a new plan announced by the government in 2007. In selected states where the sex ratio was worse, if a family had a girl, uh, gave birth to a daughter, there would be an initial cash payment of the equivalent of 385 US dollars and then there would be successive cash payments based on benchmarks, such as getting the girl vaccinated and sending her to school. Then if that girl reached 18, was unmarried, and had completed her education, they would give her a $2,000 gift to defray wedding costs, which we would translate as dowry. But dowry is illegal in India, so it's not technically for dowry, is it? So uh, in summary, and I'm ending, about 40% of the world's population lives in China and India. And the question we would like to pose as part of this conference is, will the prospects for peace and for democracy in Asia diminish in lockstep with the value of daughters there? We think that is a question worth asking. Uh, and just finally, a lot of our data analysis was run off of the Women's Stats database, the largest compilation of information about women in the world today, freely accessible online, over 310 variables for 174 countries. Uh, this morning I checked over 115,000 individual data points along with scales that we've originated and mappings of those scales. So if you're interested in pursuing research on women, uh, please feel free to visit the Women's Stats database. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Rochelle and Amy, do you have a thought or question um, to put to Valerie? Yeah, yes, um, I found your uh, statistics so compelling. And, but I was wondering, um, uh, I was curious um, uh, about, that, about your conclusions. I was wondering if you spoke Chinese and that did you interview the men that you suspect are going to be psychopathic, I think, and um, <laughs> poor, you said, and that they're unmarriageable. So did you actually meet these psychopathic and poor men? And did they say that they were unmarriageable? So I'm wondering where you got that <laughs> conclusion from. I, I'm sorry, I didn't say psychopathic. Something I said like that, right? Sociopathic, sociopathic yes. right? Um, yes. Which is a term used in sociology to, to indicate individuals who are at risk for breaking the law and pushing the limits of, of moral norms and so forth. And so um, actually, yes, I met with professors at Renmin University who have been given the equivalent of a $5 million grant by the Chinese government to actually go out and interview bare branches and to understand the situation from their perspective and to see the constraints that they feel that they, they live under. But what they have found in initial research is that the young men do feel pretty hopeless about their marriage prospects. Uh, and uh, among the floating population of China, uh, moving to the city to gain more money is often seen by young men as the only possible route to possible household formation for them in the future. Yeah, I had a question for Valerie. So Valerie, what can you tell us about some of your findings and skewed sex ratios and its relation to you know, any increase in sex trafficking of women? Um, that's, a, that's, remar that's a very good question. And yes, studies have been done, and I can send you those studies if you're interested, Amy, um, that talk about uh, the association between um, the rise in the birth sex ratio and the rise of sex trafficking. And so there, there is a, a correlation between uh, the degree of abnormality within a particular province of China and the degree of sex trafficking that they then find. Now, of course, the border provinces, because of their, their proximity to nations, poor nations like North Korea and Laos and so forth, 
um, have very high levels of trafficking as, as well. So I think there is definitely a connection there. And, and researchers have also found a definite connection to the rise of organized crime. Mm. Thank and you. to remind everyone among us what you already know, the, the term sex trafficking no longer even means crossing a border. Uh -huh. it, it is being used now. I mean, you can traffic someone from the gymnasium to the gymnasium. It, it has to do with is that person being brought under, uh, you know, thinking that she's going to be a waitress, mm -hmm. or is there some other kind of coercion that's being used? You know, you, you don't, you don't do this for me to bring in money, and and your sister will never see her children again. That that kind of, that's very or even less. Yeah. So, Rachel, would you yes. take us further? Yes, I'm gonna um, actually stand so I can read my paper. So I will go over sure. there. So um, thank you for coming this afternoon. Um, I had requested that I'm just going to read my paper, which is 10 pages long. So I, want, I requested 20 minutes. So I want to thank Ambassador Hunt for accommodating me. And I'm actually going to speak of um, sex trafficking. Um, I actually am an expert on sex trafficking. But I have to warn that I think that we're going to have some tension in our conclusions in this panel. So it's probably good then that I'm not going to get asked questions by the other panelists and then we could just segue to the next talk on sex trafficking. Oh, don't count on it. <laughs> yes. So, um, so I'm just going to read. Last year represented a milestone in the war on trafficking, or what Hillary Clinton insists is the US war on, quote, a modern day slavery, unquote. It was the 10th anniversary of the enactment of the US Trafficking Victims Protection Act, as well as the UN Trafficking Protocol. The war on trafficking turned a spotlight onto the problems of forced labor, coerced migration, debt bondage, and enslavement. And has also forged unlikely alliances bringing together right and left, feminists and evangelicals, Republicans and Democrats. After all, no one can argue against the immorality of slavery. However, as a feminist and as a labor and migration scholar, I am troubled by the US-led war on trafficking. I see this war as a threat to the advancements that women have made in labor migration. I also see this war as a form of moral imperialism, one that spreads conservative moral values regarding women's sexuality. Lastly, I see this war as not premised on the empowerment of women, but one on, uh, based on crime prevention. So the words human trafficking conjure up images of someone held against their will, shackled, and enslaved. Yet the definition of trafficking that has been advanced by the UN is more specific, but at the same time, much broader than enslavement. Trafficking involves a three-part three process. First, the transportation of an individual. Second, under coercion, conditions of force, fraud, or coercion, or deception. And third, for the purpose of their exploitation, with exploitation specifically meaning sexual exploitation, enslavement, forced labor, or servitude. Many argue that it is impossible to access real victims of trafficking. Even the UN Office on Drugs and Crime admits, quote, it is very difficult to assess the real size of human trafficking because the crime takes place underground and is often not identified or misidentified, unquote. This leaves us in a catch-22. The supposed inaccessibility of trafficked victims is often used to justify unsubstantiated claims of trafficking and the development of solutions that are not based on the actual experiences of traffic victims. At the moment, we are plagued by unreliable reports. Even the US Government Accountability Office had warned that most claims in the annual US Trafficking in Persons Report, or the TIP report, are based on scant information. But as we have learned from our foray into Iraq, fighting a war based on scant information spells trouble and developing solutions that are not based on the experiences of presumed victims is likely to have disastrous results. Surely a cause of concern, the war on traffic trafficking currently has top-down solutions. The US has universally implemented the one-size-fits-all templates of the three Rs, and that's rescue, rehabilitation, and reintegration, and the three Ps, prosecution, protection, and prevention. Countries that fail to design a solution to trafficking that abide by these two models are ostracized in the TIP report. 
Today, I want to show you that solutions which are not based on experience do not work. We see this clearly when we look at the impact of the war on trafficking on Filipina hostesses in Japan, which the US Department of State insisted were forced into sexual exploitation by the Yakuza, in other words, organized crime syndicates. The identification of migrant Filipina hostesses as trafficked persons directly affected their migration, resulting in a drastic decline in their numbers by around 90%, from more than 80,000 in 2004 to just over 8,000 in 2006. While many would see this decline as a victory in the war on trafficking, I beg to differ. What the top-down solutions of the three Ps and three Rs have done for migrant Filipina hostesses is first, it has stripped them of their livelihood by barring the re-entry to Japan, and second, it has aggravated the vulnerability to trafficking of those who still manage to return to Japan by reducing their autonomy. So let me now make my case and take you inside the world of migrant Filipina hostesses. So in 2005, I managed to enter their community which at the time was considered to be the largest group, more than 10% of the 800,000 estimated trafficked people in the world. I, I spent nine months in Tokyo, where, where I worked alongside them as a hostess in a working class club frequented by members of the Yakuza and actually owned by the Yakuza. I also visited them at their homes, patronized their businesses, and spent time with them outside of work. Contrary to the US TIP report, forced sexual exploitation had not been the norm among them. This is not to say that they had not been vul vulnerable to forced labor. However, their identification as trafficked persons has not much, done much to reduce their vulnerability. It has also not done much to help us understand their vulnerability. So migrant Filipina hostesses go to Japan of their own volition. This calls into question their identification as trafficked persons. For the most part, no one has forced or coerced them to seek work into Japan. They were not drugged, taken on a plane, and trapped in a hostess club. No one lied to them and explicitly told them that they would only be singing and dancing on stage. With few exceptions, they go to J Japan knowing they're gonna have, have to flirt with customers at a club. Notably, clubs do not require them to engage in prostitution calling into question claims of their forced ex sexual exploitation, many would actually recommend their jobs to family and friends in the Philippines. As one hostess, hostess told me, quote, why not? I would tell them that the job is good and it's in them whether they will let themselves be abused or not. That's why they think we are human trafficking, that they think that we are prostitutes, that's not true, unquote. If not prostitution, then what is the job of a hostess? Customers pay per hour to receive care, accolades, sexual titillation, and entertainment from hostesses who feed, praise, touch, sing, dance, and playfully flirt with customers. Hostesses do not perform this work uniformly. Instead, they maintain different levels of intimacy with customers, which differ according to their own moral standards on paid sex. We must acknowledge that there are multiple moralities in society with each one of us maintaining particular moral standards when it comes to sex and paid sex. Unfortunately, the most vocal of anti-trafficking pundits are radical feminists, meaning prohibitionists of paid sex. The problem I have with prohibitionists is that they promote their own moral beliefs on sex and paid sex, dismiss those who dis disagree with them as immoral, but worse, like imperialists, impose their moral beliefs on those who disagree with them. Fortunately, Filipina hostesses tend to be much more inclusive as women. They acknowledge and accept that there are multiple moralities among them. Coexisting harmoniously among them are what we could call moral conservatives, moral in-betweeners, and amoralists. Minorities among hostesses, moral conservatives are those who are likely to reject the direct purchase of sex as sinful and minimize their sexual banter with customers. In contrast, are amoralists who reject the notion of commercial sex as immoral. Amoralists are hostesses who engage in commercial sex inside or outside the club. One amoralist I met is Aurora, a former hostess who, in her, who is in her mid-40s and now works in a factory, more comf comfortable to admit her paid sexual liaisons than her real age during our interviews. She offhandedly mentioned to me her view on sex work, which she told me, quote, no, it's not bad, it's, it's in the woman, it's up to them. I've had customers try to give me $500 for a one-night stand. Of course, if you have no money at all, you'll bite, won't you, unquote. Yet most hostesses I met are not like Aurora, as they would not bite. 
Most of them are, are what I would call amoral, uh, moral in-betweeners. These are women who would never accept a direct payment for sex, but would only engage in paid sex with boyfriends. As the hostess Marietta describes, quote, I do not do one night stands. For example, you think, oh, this one keeps on coming back. He has been coming to the bar regularly for the past six months. Plus, he comes with a lot of presents. So of course, if you get a guy to do that, you feel inclined to pay him back somehow. Do you think that we're just giving them our body? No, because he's like your boyfriend. You do not think of them as a customer. You start calling them boyfriend, unquote. So Maria admits to having sex outside the club with some customers as a reward for their business, but she clarifies that she'll only do this with those to whom she feels a slight. For instance, what she said, quote, a 5%, unquote, attraction to. So as we can see, hostesses maintain different moral boundaries. Now, I would like to address the question of whether or not hostesses can do their work without violating their morals. I address this question so as to return to the claims of their sexual trafficking in the US tip report. While many hostesses insist that they somewhat control their relations with customers, there is a limit to the extent they can do this. It's when we take into account the culture of the club and how it determines hostess-customer relations that we see the possibility of forced labor. Particularly, the culture of the club might disagree with the morals of the hostess. In other words, the culture of the club might violate her moral values. It is when the moral regimes of sex at the club disagrees with the moral values on paid sex of the hostess does the likelihood of forced labor arise. This tells us that sexual exploitation is not universal, but instead situational in the case of migrant Filipina entertainers, and depends on both the moral values of the hostess as well as the moral regime of sex at her workplace. So Philippine clubs in Tokyo fall under three moral regimes that mirror the moral boundaries of hostesses. There are morally conservative, amoralist, and morally in between our clubs. Moral regimes in clubs are notably not static, and they are not only imposed by management rules from above, but, um, by the, but it's constructed via the actions that occur from below. The actions of those in, in the club, including customers, management, and work, workers, jointly determine, but not with, without conflict, the moral regime of clubs. So accordingly, changes in action could engender a sudden shift in the culture of the club. This, uh, this occurred at the club where I did field work. To my discomfort, the actions of the three new hostesses hired at our workplace fell under the moral regime of amoralists. They had no qualms undressing on the dance floor. They also encouraged customers to touch them in their private parts. These three new workers attracted customers who otherwise would not have patronized our club. Surely enough, my old co-workers quit the club one by one. These women left because they worried that the actions of the new hires would reconstitute the cultural expectations of customers who now would likely to expect a greater level of physical intimacy from them. Hostesses are aware that clubs have different moral regimes and accordingly try to find work only in places that would match their own moral views on paid sex. And if they find themselves working in a club that disagrees with their moral views, they usually quit. Unfortunately, not all hostesses can quit. Not all have the flexibility to choose their workplace. Hostesses with temporary work visas, and that's contract workers, are assigned clubs prior to their arrival in Japan. Unlike hostesses with permanent residency, contract workers cannot go by the reputation of the club and accordingly choose a club of employment that suits her moral boundaries. A moral conservative could find herself placed in an amoralist club performing work that defiles her moral boundaries. It is in this situation that a hostess could be trafficked, doing a job she wishes not to do and without an easy exit. Why she is unable to quit easily is because contract workers are financially indebted to the migrant broker who arranged her migration. To ensure payment of this debt, the broker almost always binds the hostess in Japan for a set period of time, making them indentured, but I should note, not enslaved. So indenture does not inevitably result in forced labor. Hostesses who are in situations of moral contestations, even if indentured, are not automatically subject to forced labor. Among my interviewees, some have responded to the moral violations they confronted at their workplace by escaping. Others went to the Philippine embassy and demanded repatriation. Those who did managed to return to the Philippines free of penalties. Lastly, they could, and, and some have also shifted their moral boundaries to accommodate those of their workplace. While some hostesses feel morally violated at work, most do not. More often than not, the moral boundaries of the hostess matches the moral regime of her workplace. 
So to summarize the view I've just given of hostess work from the ground, we should be hard pressed to accept the depiction of Filipina entertainers in Japan as victims of quote, modern day slavery, unquote. Still Filipinas who pursue hostess work in Japan are vulnerable to forced labor. The question then is, does the mere possibility of forced labor warrant the need to prevent hostesses from pursuing this type of work? Supporters of the US anti-trafficking campaign seem to think so, as they assume that hostesses are without any control over their situation. Without question, indenture is an unacceptable condition of migration. Hostesses need to have the flexibility to quit their jobs, which they currently cannot do for a variety of reasons. Yet the solutions of the three Ps and three Rs fail to address the problem of indenture. In fact, the solutions implemented by Japan following the recommendation of the US State Department have not increased but instead decreased their autonomy by tightening the stronghold of the broker over them. For example, after their identification as traffic persons, Japan increased the performance arts training requirement, that is singing and dancing courses, for prospective migrants from six months to two years, a move meant to ensure their professional status, but one that effectively increases their debt to the broker. Following the recommendation of the US, Japan also began to scrutinize the visa applications of return migrants more closely, disqualifying the reentry of most and consequently encouraging their use of fake visas. Ironically, Filipina entertainers who are forced into sex work have almost always, according to the Philippine Embassy in Japan, entered Japan with a fake visa. This tells us that the US-led war on trafficking has not really helped Filipina entertainers, the largest group of supposed trafficked people in the world, but instead left them more vulnerable to trafficking. So many anti-trafficking pundits actually see the rescue of Filipina hostesses and the drastic decline in their number as a victory in the war on trafficking. However, many of the Filipina hostesses I met in Japan resent the United States and reject the solution of rescue that has been imposed on them. For them, Working in Japan has been their sole path of economic mobility from abject poverty in the Philippines. The uncomfortable fact is that Filipina hostesses, who are usually among the poorest of the poor in the Philippines, willingly agree to their relation of indenture with brokers. Prior to migration, they faced two forms of unfreedom, poverty and indenture. Choosing between these two bad options, they opt to enter relations of indenture, not just because working in Japan is their most viable exit from the unfreedom of poverty, but also because they enjoy their job of flirting, singing, and dancing. From their perspective, their identification as trafficked persons and the consequent denial of their re-entry into Japan has not led to their rescue, but has instead resulted in their domination. It has resulted in the loss of their occupation, an occupation that most actually found empowering. Complaining about the intervention of the US in their lives, a hostess once asked me, quote, why is your country making our lives difficult, unquote. So in conclusion, we have to ask, does indenture automatically result in trafficking? An indentured worker who wishes to quit her job but is unable to would be a trafficked person. But what if the indentured worker wishes not to quit her job? What if she enjoys her job? It would be difficult to equate her experiences with a person who wants to quit her job. Yet, without question, both of them, the worker who hates her job and the one who loves her job, should be able to not just keep her job, but also quit it. They must have the basic rights of freedom and autonomy. So where does this leave us? If we wish to abolish trafficking, then we need to ensure the freedom and autonomy of migrant workers. We need to work on increasing their control over their labor and migration. Rescuing victims and prosecuting traffic traffickers does not help us reach this goal. In fact, I'm gonna, it's past 20. Okay. I'm gonna wrap. That's great. In fact, they do nothing for ensuring the autonomy of workers. One could actually say that most migrant workers today are vulnerable to trafficking. This is because most nation states limit the citizenship rights of migrant workers and subject them to contract labor. As contract workers, nation states bind the residency of a migrant to her employer unless one is willing to be deported back home. This would make them an indentured person vis-a-vis -vis their employer. 
why nation states deny most migrant workers the human right of free labor is beyond the scope of this brief talk, but many have argued that nation states do this to ensure the low wages of migrants and to appease anti-immigrant sentiments. Also diminishing the autonomy of migrants is the criminalization of sex work and undocumented workers, which places these workers outside of government regulation and protection. These problems are not addressed by the solutions of rescue and prosecution. To abolish trafficking, we need to ensure the autonomy and freedom of migrants. We would respect their freedom to choose their jobs. We would revisit and dismantle various exclusionary policies that limit their freedom and autonomy. We would see that the problem of trafficking is not the nature of people's activity, including sex work, but rather the degree of indenture involved for the majority of migrant workers risk their freedom, freedom and autonomy. Human trafficking is a problem of labor migration one caused by the limited rights of migrant workers and not the sexual activities of people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and I sure do appreciate your point of view coming from having been there, spent the time, been among, talked to. It's very, very valuable. And I, I had to make sure you ended on time so that you would have to take a question from your, <laughs> from your co-panelists. So either Amy or Valerie. Um, actually, I would just like to make a, a few comments um, rather than ask a question. I think America is a wonderful country because it allows us to come together and share ideas and debate one another. The issue of human trafficking is incredibly complex and many advocates and activists um, clearly have different ideas, and we all care, and we have different ideas. And there's been multiple debates over the last decade. I just think that if we are serious about combating modern slavery, we need to come together and to figure out how best to attack the problem and not one another. I think our law, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, our signature law, which has now been reauthorized three times. It's been reauthorized because we do have a problem with human trafficking. And the UN protocol, the international protocol to prevent, suppress, and punish trafficking in persons exists and has been signed and ratified by so many countries because indeed there is a problem. And there is pretty much so uh, widespread acceptance of the structural framework of prevention protection for the victims, and prosecution for the traffickers. And our office now has put out nine, soon to be 10, annual tip reports that we stand by. And we think that the information in there is, is well-researched. Um, we, we travel extensively to gather that information from the field. Our embassies and consulates are out there getting information from local non-governmental organizations and foreign government organizations and academics and researchers and reporters. And we get information also from embassies in the US. So we don't mind criticism of the TIP report. We welcome it. We welcome information. We have a channel for people to feed into us. And with that, um, perhaps I could do my presentation. Not yet. OK. Um. <laughs> First of all, I want to give Valerie also a chance if you have anything or not. Oh, I think but, Amy. But, but before. Yeah, that's fine. That did it? Yeah, I think yeah, what okay. Amy said, I think All right, then fine. I will say that in the audience, do they have cards now? You all have cards. And if you do have a question, uh, write the question down and raise it up, raise your hand. Somebody will collect. Or, or do, we not, do they not want to send it to a, a no? OK then uh, just raise even if you're in the middle and then somebody else will figure out how to do that. All right? And I just do what I'm told here. Um, <laughs> and then those cards will come up to me. We probably will only have a chance for one or two questions. I apologize in advance, but I'll tell you what I'll do. The questions that we don't have time to address, I will make sure that those are distributed to different people on the panel. And hopefully, during a break, you'd be able to come up and, and talk with those people also, individually. Right? Uh, Amy, please. Thanks. OK. Well, good afternoon. And thank you for inviting me to participate in this panel. Um, it's a pleasure to be here to speak about human trafficking with a focus on women. 
And thank you so much to the conference organizers. Really, this is an incredibly beautiful setting, and uh, particularly for this energy-filled uh, intellectual discourse. And I also wanted to thank Ambassador Swanee Hunt. Um, the very first time I learned about human trafficking was from an article that she penned in, was it Foreign Affairs or Foreign Policy? Foreign, foreign affairs. affairs. And I think it was 1996. 97. And I was hooked ever since. So thank you for introducing me to this issue. So with my time, I'm essentially going to do two things. I'm going to share some information about some of the trends and information that we're seeing in terms of trafficking of women. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we're responding to the challenges. So one of the things we've noticed is a feminization of human trafficking for both labor and sex. Information from a GTIP, that's my office, supported global database on human trafficking compiled by the In International Organization for Migration, which covers nearly 16,000 cases, assisted by IOM, covering 80 source and 100 destination countries, I think has some revealing information about some female victims. The information in this database showed that about two-thirds of trafficked females were trafficked between the ages of 18 and 30. A little over half were recruited via a personal contact for both labor and sexual exploitation, with over half reporting being sexually abused while in the process of being trafficked. So we know that women in many countries, especially developing ones, are facing enormous economic, familial, and social pressures and as a result are, in some cases, being pushed out of their countries and more vulnerable to human trafficking. Researchers have identified that domestic and sexual violence is a key push factor that makes a woman vulnerable to human trafficking. We see that women are trapped in commercial sexual exploitation in most, if not all, countries. Equally troubling, we hear and see that women are also arrested for participating in a crime that often victimizes them, rather than being provided with services. Beyond the inherent exploitation in sex trafficking, research shows that victims of sex trafficking experience physical violence, rapes and assaults, and many of the victims suffer symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. In addition to sex trafficking, we find women trapped working in fields and factories, mines and restaurants. We find sh sweatshops where women are toiling, sewing garments and peeling shrimp, weaving carpets under the threat of violence. And often these women face not only enslavement, but also sexual abuse and sexual assault. We know that women are on the move with an increasing number of women migrating for work. A World Bank report on the international migration of women shows that the number of migrants around the world has increased from 120 million in 2005 to over 213 million, with at least 49% of this population being female. And sort of to reiterate the point, women, particularly those from developing countries in Asian, Africa, and Latin America, are frequently denied access to education and other economic opportunities, and so they're going to seek new opportunities to provide for themselves or their family. This may entail opting to seek risky employment or accepting seemingly too good to be true job offers from either personal contacts or from unscrupulous labor brokers. We've noticed the increasingly deceitful nature of labor recruiting, with the consequences being women are trapped in labor trafficking situations. But we also see negative consequences from ill thought out or restrictive policies that seek to protect women by controlling travel or immigration of single women or younger women only to fuel their feelings of disempowerment. And one specific area of concern had lately has been domestic servitude. And we find migrant domestic workers around the world that are increasingly vulnerable to forced labor. These domestic workers are working without contracts in unregulated and unenforced workplaces. Often there tends to be legal, little legal recourse for these women. 
Many countries do not offer legal protections to domestic workers, even under their prevailing labor laws. So in, as, in essence, their work is cast off as something other than regular employment. Some countries' sponsorship laws grant the employer of a foreign domestic worker the power to decide when she can leave the workplace and if she can leave the, the country. So the lack of legal protections, the enhanced social isolation, and the general lack of personal autonomy inherent in a live-in domestic service are all enablers, we think, for involuntary servitude. And we do see abuses, the confiscation of travel documents, withholding of wages, confinement, no time off, isolation from community and family and friends, and yes, physical and sexual abuse. In Indonesia, we've seen scores of women and girls leaving to find work abroad, including as domestic servants in East Asia and the Middle East. Five years ago, the majority of the country's six to nine million migrants were men. Now over 70% are women and girls. We see new routes of feminized migration from Madagascar to Lebanon, from Ethiopia to the Persian Gulf states, and from Southeast Asia to the Middle East. So this is a little bit about some of the trends and information that we're seeing. And now I want to shift to tell you a little bit about some of our policies and programs and tools to address these challenges and, and protect. And you've got about five more minutes. I'll have to be fast. But I do want to note that we are collaborating with strong female partners. We are not just looking at women as victims. We are also seeing them as partners and a strong part of the solution. Programmatically, our office has roughly $74 million allocated to about 211 projects in 76 countries. We are supporting um, prevention and protection policies and programs. We're pressing foreign governments to protect, to prosecute the traffickers and the facilitators. Our office supports programs such as early identification and intervention practices for highly vulnerable populations, including girls who have run away or who are living on the street. We support programs that use multidisciplinary teams to ensure that victimized women and girls receive a wide range of tailored services. We support shelters and programs designed to establish the physical and emotional safety for these women and girls. Programs where the staff is well trained in understanding sexual exploitation, the realities of prostitution and sex trafficking, and the physical, psychological, and spiritual impact of the trauma. But we also fund programs that assist women and girls in moving forward and becoming in, independent in, by integrating life skills and employment training. Our office recently joined forces with the International Business Leaders Program, program to provide job and life skills trainings for trafficking survivors in countries in Brazil, Vietnam, and Mexico. We are also um, doing other things, such as collaborating closely with other federal agencies in regards to the federal acquisitions regulation to ensure that all US government contracts include a prohibition that prohibits any form of trafficking in persons by US contractors, contract employees, subcontractors, and subcontractor employees. The State Department and the Defense Department have also been part of a multi-stakeholder process that recently led to nearly 60 private security companies signing on to the International Code of Conduct for private security service providers. These companies pledge to uphold a number of principles, both in their company policies and in the conduct of their personnel, including in not engaging in or benefiting from human trafficking or sexual exploitation. We've also partnered with NGOs and federal agencies to develop an information pamphlet on the legal rights and resources for aliens applying for employment or education-based non-immigrant visas. So essentially, these immigrants will know their rights when they're in the United States and how to access assistance should they need it. This pamphlet is being distributed at our embassies and consulates around the globe and also posted on federal websites. 
And in just a little over 18 months, this pamphlet alone has generated over 800 calls to the National Human Trafficking Hotline. And the State Department has new directives and improved safeguards designed to protect domestic workers, especially those employed by foreign mission personnel. So these safeguards include things like transparent payment mechanisms, contracts in the employee's own language, signed by both the diplomat and the domestic worker, and the implementation of a system to track allegations of abuse and for NGOs and attorneys to report cases. The State Department has also strengthened its own internal policies regarding employing domestic workers. And our diplomatic security and or the Office of the Inspector General fully investigates any reports, reports of abuse of domestic staff by State Department employees serving overseas. We're also trying to beat the technology curve, or at least stay current with it, encountering human trafficking. We're trying to work with partners in the technology community and NGOs and other experts to figure out how to best utilize technology against the traffickers and the perpetrators and to assist in rescuing and assisting the victims. These are just some of our public-private partnerships. I think my time is, is running short, so I think perhaps I will um, conclude there, but I appreciate your time and attention. Great, thank you. Thank you, and I'm going to combine now this, this time among us up here on the stage. Thank you. Um, oh. And, and say any comments to any of you, that any of you have for each other, any questions that you have for each other. Amy, do you mind if we combine the ones for you with this discussion? And uh, Valerie, I may have let you off too easy after you spoke by saying, does anyone have a question instead of a question or a comment? So, mm -hmm. so now, uh, anything among the three of you that you would like to bring up right now in conversations with each other, and then I will ask a general question or two from the audience. A question for Amy. Sure. Um, I'd be interested in um, how uh, your office uh, came to the point of view that the U.S. should also be included. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe tell us why it wasn't originally, and then tell us uh, how that uh, evolved. Sure. Well, we. Um, you know, as the State Department and engaging foreign governments, clearly for years it's been a challenge to be out in the field and talking to other countries about um, what they think, you know, the, the most effective ways for them to, to combat human trafficking in their countries. Although I really like to say, I think, you know, so often in our, converse, in our conversations we're we're sharing promising practices, we're sharing information. The US has always had the USG assessment to combat human trafficking that we have put out every year for several years, and that's a 70, 80 page report that was looking at, that was basically a transparent report talking about the prosecutions that we've had, talking about the monies expended to um, assist trafficking victims. And so we have laid out our record in the past, including a section on recommendations where we, the United States, could do better. But then, of course, we were happy when Secretary Clinton announced that in addition to that annual USG assessment, we would indeed be including ourselves in the annual trafficking in persons report. And 12 pages yet last year. And I think that it, it's a good report. Um, we have a huge section on recommendations where we, the United States, can do better. Um, being on tier one does not mean you do not have a problem and there's not room for improvement. It just means that you're meeting the basic minimum standards. So we welcome the secretaries. Um, call, and it, it definitely, I think, has been welcomed by um, many of our partners abroad. Thank you. Another thought among yourselves? Yeah. Um, I, I'm really glad that, um, you know, with Lucy DeBacca's, like, um, arrival and that the focus of the trafficking office has really not been on sex work or so much, but have recognized domestic work, which I do see as one of the more vulnerable groups of 
migrant workers, but it is quite tricky, however, to lump all of them as traffic people, you know? I mean, because I've written a book on domestic workers and I often get asked to keynote conferences on domestic work, actually, and so that's been a question for us, which is that these women face extreme subjugation in spaces that um, are not like, considered a workplace and right. that, the, you know, and countries, including the U.S., don't recognize domestic work as a form of employment. And so then they have a contradictory position where they're actually coming in as labor migrants with contracts doing a job that's not an occupation. Mm -hmm. And so how do you, I mean, it does leave them vulnerable, mm -hmm. right? I mean, so do you structurally call the countries out? You know, so how do you right. deal with that? No, I, I think it is in incredibly complex. And, you know, we have been sorting, pull to, pulling together just different stakeholders to help guide and direct us on this issue. And, you know, I think, and I was, I was basically shortening my talk as I was going along, um, there's so many more things that we're doing in terms of domestic worker safeguards. And, you know, I mean this sincerely, like, you know, we would welcome sort of the input, you know, if you've done research to sort of help us um, guide the lay of the land. Um, and it is, you know, it is an issue that we do see globally and we do see that you know that so many of these these individuals really do not have a solid legal recourse and there is sort of like i said that that sort of lack of protection and autonomy that's inherent in a live in situation any other thoughts would you like to respond to amy in terms of that okay all right well shall i tell you all what you all are wondering about? Uh, there's this whole category of comments and questions that are going into detail, like um, in terms of the ages or the, the gender or the breakdown or, or the effect of patriarchy or the effect of, of one uh, or another cause behind the various things that, that you're talking about. And those I'm going to separate out into piles and among the, the three topics you've raised. and. And then, if we have time, I'll raise some of those. But the, the uh, thread that's going through these 30 questions that we've received have to do with policies. And Amy, you've gotten the closest to that. But I think any of you, the more you can go into, given what you've seen statistically, given what you've seen on the ground talking to the women with this qualitative research, uh, Amy, with this broad view that you have, you know, you know the UN provisions and the the bills that the U.S. government has passed, and, and other countries as well. What are the key few policy recommendations that you have related to this particular topic? And they may be 180 degrees, you know, pointing in different directions, mm -hmm. and that is quite interesting. You know, it's quite okay and quite interesting. Any of you? Uh, sure, I'll go first. Um, as we've seen with the issue of um, sex selective abortion, um, having laws on the books that simply criminalize the behavior uh, has, has not been enough. Uh, and, and so um, when we look at policy initiatives that could change the broader context of incentives and disincentives, one of the key policies is to promote gender equity in the workforce. What we have discovered is that uh, when girls, uh, when women are marginalized or treated inequitably in terms of pay and so forth, uh, then um, the, the arrival of a girl in the household as, as a daughter is, is, is not seen as providing economic benefit in the future for the family. Um, as I mentioned, uh, uh, in, during my time in Beijing, I got to meet researchers working on this question, and they discovered that when there was less gender inequity in the workforce, that the sex ratios, the imbalance in the sex ratios was ameliorated. So that would be number one. Um, I think, um, of course, in the case of China, uh, loosening the one-child policy would be a tremendous um, intervention. Now, it does not mean um, that loosening the one-child policy and going to a two-child policy would rectify uh, the birth-sex ratios, because 
uh, surely uh, those who have a boy first may be indifferent about the sex of their second child, but those who have a girl first will still not be indifferent concerning the sex of their second child. But it would be a tremendous move in the right direction. So those are, those are two that I would put very high on my list. In fact, Valerie, when I was in China, the U.S. Embassy told me that, that there was in many places a two-child policy, and it was that if you had a, a if you had a boy first, you could only have the one. If you had a girl first, you got another chance that's at right, having a boy. That's right. In fact, um, among demographers, the joke is that it's actually a 1.35 child policy. So if you're uh, a member of a minority group or if you're in designated rural areas, it, uh, among minorities, the, uh, there's not a one-child policy at all. But among certain rural areas, yes, if your first child is a girl, you are allowed to, to have a second child without punishment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, what, what else in terms of policy, very specifically okay. policy recommendations? Okay, policy recommendations. I, I mean, I, I know that um, you won't agree with this, but I just have to say it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, it's so, not the first time today. <laughs> so, um, like, so for instance, you know, I, I'm looking at sex workers in Japan right now, and, um, and so we know that there is a demand. Some people choose to fight this by decreasing the demand, but my perspective is the demand is there. And so for instance, in the Netherlands, we all know that prostitution is legal and that there is a demand. And the problem, however, is that they don't give visas to migrant workers who do sex work. Like, they don't give visas... Um, like it's not a labor um, migration category for them. And so then a lot of the sex workers or migrants who go to the Netherlands are then susceptible to abuse because they're like outside the boundaries of the law. So I would say give visas to people that you're demanding work from, right? That's one. But then in terms of domestic work, I mean, I could really focus on domestic work because most of my research has actually been not on sex work, but domestic workers. And um, this is like a problem is that most migrant women today are domestic workers. And most of them are contract workers. And as contract workers, they are linked to what's called a, citizenship, a citizen sponsor or a sponsor. And that's the case in the US. That's the case in Denmark. And that's the case in you know, the United Arab Emirates. And the problem is that they don't have the flexibility to choose their employer. And so if they're abused, um, their only recourse is like they can leave, right? But a lot of times they're in debt, so they don't want to leave. And so it's only the United Kingdom that actually, because of the work of people like Bridget Anderson in Kalayaan, that has, that has given dom migrant domestic workers this flexibility to choose their employers. And so I think you know, we really need to give more autonomy to migrant workers, whether they're sex, sex workers and, or domestic workers, and have policies that make them not subject to one employer, for instance. But, so I think the problem is really migrant workers are so mistrusted because of anti-immigrant sentiments. And so nation states basically limit their incorporation, and they do that by binding them to a person they have to work for. So I think you know, we have to link this to larger policies, is, policy issues of migration, I think. That's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I would say um, so many of our um, our policies really stem from sort of the combined wisdom of the President's Interagency Task Force on Trafficking. This is our cabinet level task force that's chaired by Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. So they just met February 1st, and, um, you know, it was a time to, to come together, but one of the areas that um, everybody was sort of talking about that we want to look at more closely over the next year is the area of the provision of services to trafficking victims inside the United States and sort of, you know, strengthen um, some policies in, in that regard. I would also just, and, and this moves a little bit um, away from the policy track, but I would want to add a point about, you know, one of our themes has really been partnerships and really tapping into previously untapped um, stakeholders and reaching out to the business community and the private sector and ensuring that they are doing what they can to ensure that they have strong ethical codes of conduct and that they're monitoring and evaluating their supply chains to ensure there's not human trafficking in their supply chains. 
The other sort of big picture theme is technology, and I really feel that this is an important area because technology and social media and marketing um, is, is here and it's everywhere. And I think we need to figure out the best way to harness it. And so it's been really exciting to sort of come together and start talking about you know, the use of um, mobile tools to extend the quality um, of training or communication among anti-trafficking NGOs in rural areas. Or potentially, could there be an app to verify a point employment so people that are going abroad would know whether or not it's a legitimate job or to help um, cross-border guards determine, you know, if something comes in and they, it looks like a trafficking situation, if they can get that information quickly to, to headquarters. Thank you. And I'm about to endear myself to Barbara by uh, ending this early, one minute only, yeah. uh, and, uh, and say that in terms of policy, I actually have been working a lot on the demand side of this. And uh, Rochelle, you mentioned about the, the whole idea of demand. So if anyone is interested in looking at what Sweden is doing and Norway and, and Great Britain and some other countries, and instead of, instead of um, well, if you think about this as a, a supply-demand chain, and uh, there's so much focus on how do we help these poor victims instead of saying, you know, who the hell are these guys uh, who are doing this? And what do we do to say, no, it's not only not okay to beat your wives, and it's not okay for little boys to slug each other on the playground, it's also not okay to buy bodies of women who don't want to be in that situation. Russell, I'll go that far, okay? <laughs> and uh, if anyone wants to talk about that, I am also available during the break, and would you join me now in thanking our panelists?